thank you guys so much for leading us in such awesome worship. That was good, huh? Yep. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. And we just praise God for allowing us to have uh, talent in this church this small that can uh, lead us in such a way. We're very, very blessed. And uh, we don't want to ever forget that. It's great having all of you here this morning. Uh, it's also good, uh, hopefully, to have those of you that are joining us this afternoon by YouTube. Uh, we miss you, but we understand that some of you have conditions that you uh, feel like you need. You shouldn't get out and be around other people uh, because your health is compromised, so we understand that. Uh, I found out this morning that uh, Soul Zone has really been hit hard this past week. Uh, uh, Ray and Kay uh, po possibly have COVID. They don't know for sure. They are being tested. It'll be another few days before it comes back. And if they do, they exposed um, uh, Rick and Carol. Mm -hmm. And so we're not sure about that. But in the midst of all that, Carol had a stroke is in the hospital. Oh, no. So uh, that's the president and vice president of Soul Zone uh, being hit in that manner. And uh, I would just really encourage you to, to pray for them. Uh, Steve and, and Deb were telling me about it this morning. and. Uh, and so we need to pray for them. Uh, they uh, are really in a in a, a, a fix right now, and hopefully they'll find out that they do not have the COVID. Uh, I think the hard thing for Rick was to take Carol to the hospital and have to leave her. Couldn't go in with her, and and, uh, and that's that's got to be a hard thing at this time. That sucks. Yes, You've been there, done that, had you? Yeah, I have a friend in Tennessee that I talked to that the same thing. Uh, and they didn't get back with him on anything. You at least got some information back. Yeah, because I just kept calling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just bug them to death. Huh? Let me uh, say before we get into our study this morning, I want to take just a minute, a couple of minutes actually, to remind you of some things that we have covered and studied in the past that you may be uh, remembering, or some of you may not have been here with us, and, and it may be something that's helpful to you. But we are living in uh, a very uh, interesting time right now, a very serious time in terms of uh, where we are biblically uh, as, as we come closer to the return of Christ to come and uh, rapture His church. Um, I have taught, and I think most people in our church believe, that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, which means that Jesus will come and take the church up into heaven prior to the seven-year tribulation on earth when the Antichrist and the false prophet and, and all of those horrible things come to pass. But uh, <clears throat> there are some things that are interesting in Scripture that we might need to think about. Uh, one is... One of the things that will trigger the uh, uh, presence and the coming of the Antichrist is going to be the peace treaty that he will make with Israel. And so I was asked this morning about what about the treaty that, that uh, President Trump just signed that his son-in-law worked out over the past uh, several months and probably years uh, with uh, one of the Arab. Uh, nations and uh, so this this is a serious thing and my answer to that is I do not believe that this is the treaty that is the the big one that will be the the, the opening thing that will usher in the Antichrist but I believe it's a forerunner and I believe we should look at it with great uh, significance just like we look at the pandemic we're seeing a worldwide pandemic right now, okay? That is not what is going to happen in the first part of the tribulation, but it is a strong forerunner of it, in which there will be a time in which one-third of the population of the world will die in that first three and a half years of the tribulation. Well, this is a forerunner. 
And so we're having some things like that, and I think we need to be aware of that. Now, I believe personally that uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 gives us a really important insight. It says that the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will not come until that which restrains him is taken out of the way. And I believe that that which restrains him that will be taken out of the way will be the Holy Spirit that is within the church that will be raptured out. Now, what does that really translate to us? Again, it's a pre-tribulation rapture. And we as Christians may see some serious things happen before all the real serious stuff begins. But I truly believe that we will be raptured out before that. We are part of what has to be taken out before the man of lawlessness will reveal himself. And then that will be revealed in conjunction with the real uh, treaty that the Antichrist will make with Israel at that time, which will trigger who the Antichrist is for people that are still left on earth if they know Scripture. They'll be able to recognize the Antichrist because he's the one that's made this big uh, peace treaty. Now, there's another thing that I think we need to think about right now, and that is this. If there's, there's, a, there's a war that's going to take place out of Ezekiel uh, 38 and 39 called the Gog-Magog War. Now, we can't be exactly certain when this is going to take place, but I believe it's going to take place somewhere in connection with all of those events of the Antichrist, the beginning of the tribulation, the signing of the peace treaty, all of those things. Now, it's interesting that what will entail that war is this. Russia and the Arab nations will gather together and they will come to attack Israel. Now, there's something interesting in Scripture about that attack. And it's simply this. No nation, no one comes to Israel's aid. Now, right now, if Russia and Arab nations attacked Israel or made a move in that direction, the United States of America, under President Trump's leadership, would be all over that with every power we had. So something has got to happen to this nation. Either we'll have a Democratic Party come in that would not do anything for Israel, or we could get weak enough and broken down enough financially and our military uh, just have nothing to function with. Something has got to happen to the United States of America before that Gog Magog war happens that brings us to a place that we will not, for whatever reason, stand with our ally Israel. So, when you think about the events that are going on in our world right now, when you think about the possibility of a democratic administration coming in, that will stop the involvement with Israel. You can see what Trump has done. Trump has done something with Israel that no president has ever done. And that was bring uh, the, the uh, uh, embassy to Israel, to, to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. That was a humongous statement about Israel, Jerusalem being the seat of Israel, okay, the, the, the place of authority. I mean, and, 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 and that's so biblically connected, okay? So much so that, that, that Israel has put out a coin, and it's an interesting coin. It has a, a, a face that draws out what they uh, think about King Cyrus from the Old Testament that was the uh, uh, Gentile uh, ruler that did so much for Israel under God's leadership. And then they have placed over that the face outline of President Trump. Saying that in their understanding, Trump has done just like another King Cyrus did for Israel. 
It's a powerful statement. And Israel put that out quite some time ago. So we know the connection that our, our country has and that Trump has with Israel right now. But if, if, if a Democratic administration comes in, no doubt that will end. So whatever it is that can bring us to our knees to not stand up for Israel, it could be soon approaching, whatever that is. And that is simply another indication of where we are in end time prophecy. Uh, when Israel came back as a nation, May 15, 1948, that started God's final countdown to the end. And many, many, many important prophecies have been fulfilled since then. But what we're living in right now is the, the leading up and the building up to the fulfillment of many other final prophecies that are going to be very important in the days ahead. And so I, I just wanted to take a minute and review some of that with some of you that haven't, you haven't heard that teaching for a while. We went through all of that uh, for a long period of time uh, a few years ago, uh, studying the Revelation, Matthew 24, and Daniel, and all those things that connect with that. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's a reminder, and maybe some of you have not gone through a study like that. So it would be important for you to sort of know what's going on in the world at this point in time. <clears throat> okay, Belize says, what about the mark of the beast? Now, this is also an interesting thing that we need to think about. Uh, I may have told you this, uh, I told somebody this, but uh, Belita and I were over in uh, uh, Baker the other day. We were taking a, taking a ride and circle around and back into Baker. And Belita always likes to hit the shops, and I don't want to hit the shops. So I was down at the service station filling up and getting ready to leave and all. And this guy rides up on a bicycle. And he jumps off that bicycle and he comes up to me and he says, don't take, the, don't take the vaccine. Don't take that injection. It's the mark of the beast. Really? <laughs> so so, so I, I'm hearing this guy, you know, and he's just, he's just serious about this. He's running around spreading this everywhere. Uh, and he's so serious about it, he comes back on the motorcycle a few minutes later. <laughs> And talks to me again about it, and uh, and so I thought, you know, this this is something that is is going around that it, it really needs the church really needs to know where we are and what to believe and what not to believe and what's going on. Now, when you think about the mark of the beast, let me say a couple of things. One is, if you read in the Revelation. Uh, uh, if you want to read all of it in context uh, verses uh, chapters 12 through 14 but if you read in the Re Re revelation about the mark of the beast the antichrist and all of those things that take place uh, uh, surrounding the mark of the beast you're going to find something very important the mark of the beast comes at the midpoint of the tribulation three and one half years into the tribulation now, if we're correct with a pre-tribulation rapture, the church will have been gone three and a half years uh, before the mark of the beast has anything to come into play or an effect, okay? Now, the mark of the beast is going to be something that, you, that, that people who have become Christians during the tribulation, the scripture is clear, they will not fall into it because they're saved. But it's the lost world that will be deceived. And what will happen in that, in their deception, is that the Antichrist, there will be a, 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 an image built of the Antichrist. And there will be the requirement that people bow and worship the image of the beast, the image of the Antichrist. And then they will get the mark, the 666, on their hand or forehead that will then give them the right to continue to buy and sell. Those who have become Christians during the uh, tribulation will not receive that mark and will not be able to buy and sell. They'll be put in a very bad situation. 
but the church should not be a part of that. We should be gone three and a half years prior to that. So that should not be a worry or a concern on our part. I would go on and say this. I'm going to draw a line in the sand for myself personally. And that is simply this. I'm not taking any chips. I'm not going to do that. I'm not taking a chip that they can find out where I am every minute of my day in life. I'm not going to take that. And that may put us in a bad spot at some point in time in the future. I'm not saying I won't do it because I think that's the mark of the beast. Because I believe, I believe we've got to go with Scripture. And we've got to understand the Scripture and what it teaches about when that happens, how it happens. You don't fall into it, as Belita says, by accident. You make a willful choice. Just like you made a willful choice to accept Jesus Christ, you didn't become a Christian by accident. Okay? You're not going to become a worshiper of the beast because you fail to get some bit of information and fall into it by accident. Okay? We're not going to be there. The church is not. But the believers, the people who become believers in the tribulation will be there. They will have to deal with that, which is a, a really good reason for people to get saved now yeah. instead of waiting until later. Okay? So hopefully that may be of some benefit uh, to us as we think about uh, these kind of things that we're talking about. One thing I'd like to touch on is at the start you talked about the covenant being signed. Um, one of the things that, that I believe is that when that covenant is signed by whoever with Israel, that's when they will build the temple and start their sacrifices. Again. Yes. <clears throat> True. Um, and it's in the temple that the abomination of desolation that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 will take place. And it's 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 believed it's 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 in the temple where this image will will be placed and and well actually the, the antichrist will take his seat on the throne uh claiming to be god and that will be the thing that will that will cause israel who has been uh in favor with the antichrist i mean he's he's done all kinds of things for him let him build the temple all of that that'll be the time that that israel breaks off from the antichrist and that'll start the the real serious last three and a half years of the tribulation, which the Antichrist will then seek to uh, come against Israel in a in a huge manner, and God will uh, will supernaturally protect them uh, through that last uh, one thousand two hundred sixty days, and then at the end of that, the remnant of Israel. There's always been a remnant of Israel. In the Old Testament, whenever. Just like there's a remnant of the church, really. There, there's all those who claim to be Christians. But there's really only a part of what is called the church that's true Christians. Okay? <clears throat> Many are just Christian by name. Okay? So there will be a remnant of Israel that will recognize and accept Jesus at the end of the tribulation. And... Uh, so that's that's another whole thing, but uh, hopefully that's some things that maybe will keep your head straight uh, when people are coming to tell you all kinds of weird things on bicycles in parking lots. <laughs> he went on to tell me this, that he was a medical doctor, and uh, he knew all these things. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what a doctor looks like, but he didn't look like <laughs> Yes? I read the other day that Syria, Syria is getting real serious about this uh, thing with Israel. Yes, yeah. peace treaty, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Peace treaty. Yeah. You've already got Jordan and Egypt. Yeah. Right. And so now here's the third. And now here's the... Yeah. 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 yeah uh, and Russia's already in cahoots with a bunch of them. Oh, absolutely. 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 Russia's on it. Russia, you we can't count Russia out. You know, uh, they're going to have a part in the end, a big time. It, it was thought at one time Russia was finished and that, no, not biblically. Uh, 
But I would say this to you as we get into the study for today. Uh, all of this should not cause us to be fearful. All of this should do something very biblical and that's very important. It says, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. When all of these things are happening, and as every little piece just comes like a puzzle and is placed in its place, we as believers need to be looking up because Jesus could come at any minute. And I believe with everything in me, biblically and with the experiences that are going on around us right now, that I may not see it, but there will be people of my generation that will be on this earth when Jesus raptures the church. Yes. I believe that's a true prophecy out of, out of uh, Matthew 24. And if you would like to know more about that, I don't want to take time with it now. I'd be glad to show you where you can read that yeah. and see what you think about it. The, yes, sir. The thing that amazes me was the Old Testament emphasized that Israel was put back as a nation in one day. In day. That's and what they did. Happened. Yes. And they would and the language would be restored. And the language that had been lost was restored. Yes. Yes. Can a nation be born in one day? No. Yep. Happened. Yeah. And and, and and that's the thing that separates us from all the other generations uh, in Christianity. All through the, the generations of Christians, there has been the expectancy for Jesus to return. And that's the way it was supposed to be. It was to be an imminent thing in the lives of Christians. And so all the way through, Paul was saying, I mean, he was thinking he's going to come in his lifetime, you know. So all the way through, Christians, biblical Christians have believed and expected that. Now, have they been wrong? No, they were doing what's right. But there's one thing different. You say, well, what's the difference now with us to be saying these things over against the ones that said it 100 or 500 years ago? The one thing is what he just said. Israel brought back as a nation in one day. That's the key. When that happened, then, then that put us right at the door. And then all of these other things that have been happening uh, the, 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 the war in 67, uh, you know, that, that got them... Uh, six-day war. Yeah, six-day war uh, that got them uh, uh, it, uh, Jerusalem again, and, and all of these things that just played right into, into, into play with all of it. And uh, so it, it's exciting. Okay, all right, let's go with what we... Yes? Can I say just one thing about the... the uh, Vaccine. I, yeah. I won't take it because anything that Bill Gates has to do with that <laughs> vaccine uses uh, baby stem cells. Okay. Does not use the human stem cell. And yeah. I will not have any. Good, good point. Good point. Uh, Belita says, from a medical position, I'm not going to take it because who can make a vaccine that quick that can be used? <laughs> Okay, so we got a lot of things to think about, but now I want us to change gears, okay? Let's get with what we got going today. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at 16 through 18. So uh, that other part was free. This is the part you're paying for. Okay? <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, we'll be at verse 16 in just a minute. If you want to follow your Bible, if you don't have your Bible, Michael have it up on the screen for us. And uh, it'll be Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Let me say, uh, acknowledge before we start, I'll be referencing some material today from Carson and White. I'll be using the interlinear Greek English New Testament, the analytical Greek lexicon, and the Revised Standard, the American Standard, and the New Living Translations uh, as we look at these verses of Scripture. So, <clears throat> verse 16, God. Uh, John Wright, uh, Paul writes on the inspiration here of the Holy Spirit and he says for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him <clears throat> we closed our study last week with Jesus talking about uh, him being 
uh, the firstborn of all creation. Paul mentioning that about Jesus. And uh, we realize that some have misinterpreted this. They've been interpreted incorrectly. And they have gotten from this statement that Jesus uh, was a created being. And if Jesus is a created being, then He cannot be God. And so there are those who take this verse of Scripture and, and teach very strongly that Jesus is not God because this Scripture is saying He was a created being. Now as we look at verse 16 today, we're going to realize that Jesus is not a created being. Instead, Jesus is the creator of every being. Okay? And we're going to see this. It, it, it doesn't need interpretation by anyone. It's clearly stated. You don't have to be a, a, a theologian with a doctor's degree to understand it. It's clearly stated what we're going to see, that Jesus is the Creator. Now Paul clearly writes that Jesus, as he says, by Him, referring to Jesus, all things were created. Now this should settle everyone's understanding of the fact that Jesus was not a created being. Instead, Jesus was the Creator. And, uh, and Jesus, as we saw last week in verse 15, is the visible image of the invisible God. Amen. That's a powerful, beautiful statement. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Now that simply translates to this so simply is this. When you see Jesus, you've seen God. Jesus is God. We saw last week that the Father dwells in life that is unapproachable. No man has seen or will ever see. But Jesus is on the throne at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And so th this is... This is this is the truth of Scripture. Don't ever be misled by those who would come and knock on your door and tell you Jesus is not God, that He's just a created being. He's not. He's the Creator. Now when Paul writes saying that all things were created by Jesus, the all things there in the Greek means all things in all respects. It's, it's all, meaning really all. All things in all respects. Next Paul gives some categories in which Jesus is outlined as the Creator. <clears throat> Verse of the first one is, Jesus is the Creator of all things in the heavens and on earth. What a statement. <clears throat> the Greek word translated heavens here reverse, refers to that celestial realm. It refers to that uh, particular place where the, the seat and abode of God is where uh, the angels and the glorified spirits are. We're talking about the heavens. And it can be the heavens that are just around us here that we see, or it can be the heavens in all that you see at night and you know, people see through telescopes and all of these things on up to wherever the throne of God is at this present time. Jesus created all of that. So in all respects, in the heavens, Jesus has created everything that is there. Okay? That's a powerful statement. Next, Jesus has created all things on earth. <laughs> on earth uh, is the Greek word that means the inhabitants of the earth. So everything that you would consider as an inhabitant on this earth has been created by Jesus. And that's a broad thing. I, I would count... The, the, the bugs and the snakes and the fish and the animals and the people and everything. I mean, every inhabitant on this earth has been created by Jesus. Now, third, Jesus is the creator of all things that are visible and invisible. That is all things that may be seen and all things that exist that are not seen by the human eye. Do you realize that scripturally we're on solid ground right now to say there are, there are heavenly beings 
in this building, in this room, right now with us that we do not see. Okay? There are angels here that we do not see. Jesus created all of those. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are fallen angels that we call demons that are around us in the world that we do not see. But they are just as real as the flesh and blood beings that we do see. And, and we need to think about that. And that's the kind of thing that we don't see here, but that Jesus created them and they're in existence. Thus, Jesus has created all things that we can see as well as the world of heavenly beings that we at this time cannot see. Okay? <clears throat> He's the one that did it. Now, for he is the creator of all things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. <clears throat> now, we're going to talk about the meaning of these four different things here. <clears throat> but let me tell you right off the bat, don't be upset when you find that they all just sort of dovetail back into pretty much the same meaning with each other. I mean, they're just so closely related, it's hard to separate the words uh, in the Greek to even be separate. They're so close in meaning. But let's look at them anyway. <clears throat> Jesus is the creator of all thrones. <clears throat> this is the word in the Greek that we would have the, our English word for potentate. Okay? <clears throat> that would be something that would refer to a powerful person, a ruler, a monarch. Okay? So Jesus is the creator. <clears throat> and I think we need to say... Jesus is the creator of all, all authorities that are in existence in the world now. Okay? But we also need to think about those authorities that are in existence in the heavenly places that we don't see. And remember Ephesians chapter 6, it makes a very clear statement that talking about us as Christians, we do not fight against flesh and blood. That's not who we war against as Christians. Or, or what's warring against us. But it's principalities, powers, and spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places. So, we see then that there has been, Jesus created all the angels. And we know that the top angel decided to rebel and try to take over. And we know that Scripture tells us that a third of the angels that Jesus created chose to follow Him. And so they become the fallen angels. And they are operating in the world under the leadership uh, of, of Satan. And they're doing many uh, bad things. But they have been created by Jesus. So these authorities and rulers that we're talking about here can sort of go to those on earth that Jesus has put in place and those in the heavens. Jesus is the creator of all dominions. This is the Greek word again for authorities and lordships. Jesus is the creator of all rulers or authorities. This is the Greek word meaning those who are in power and authority. Again, I would think we should look at those in power and authority on this earth and those that are in power and authority in the heavenlies. We know that there are uh, hierarchies in terms of the demonic spirits. We know that uh, from Scripture. Uh, we know uh, from Scripture that there are certain uh, entities that are demonic beings that are powerful and they're given rule over whole regions. Okay? You, you can learn that from Daniel. Uh, and so all of these beings are out there. We know that there's Michael the archangel who is a powerful angel that is named in Scripture. And all the other angels that would that would work under the authority of Jesus in terms of doing good things uh, in the world. So, <clears throat> Jesus then is the creator of all of these powers, all of these authorities, all of these rulers, all of these beings that exist. And uh, <clears throat> they include then uh, the angels of God and the angels of the devil, the fallen angels. Now, all of these are... Uh, have been created 
due to the, the power of Jesus. And uh, they are subject to Him. Now, an interesting thing that Scripture says very plainly is simply this. That we as Christians, not only are the demonic spirits, the fallen angels, all subject to Jesus, but the Scripture says that we as Christians, they are subject to us in Jesus' name. We have power and authority over every devil and demon in the name of Jesus. That's Scripture. That's bottom line Scripture. And we need to realize that. So Jesus has authority and Jesus has given us authority over them as we use His name. You try to deal with them in your name and you may have a problem. But you, you, you deal with them in Jesus' name and, and you're going to be okay. Now, He is the agent and the goal of their creation. They exist with a view to His glory and are useful and of service in a subordinate capacity to Jesus the Creator. Everything is subordinate to Jesus the Creator. Okay? Paul tells us that all things have been created through Him and for Him. All things created through Jesus makes Christ the agent then by whom all things have come into being. All things created for Jesus makes Christ the goal as well as the origin of creation. All things have been created to fulfill His aims, serve His purpose, and promote His glory. Thus there is nothing higher, greater, more powerful, or more glorious in all that we would deal with than Jesus. And we need to realize that and we need to realize that Jesus is one with the Father. And we need to realize that when Jesus left this earth, 50 days later, on the birthday of the church, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And it's been the Spirit of God that has been operating in the world since then. And every born-again believer has the Spirit of God living inside of them. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when you use the name Jesus, <clears throat> leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit that is within you, you don't need to fear the demons because they fear you. Because you have authority over them in that, in that sense. Remember that. You may need to know that someday. Now, uh, so let's go on now with verse 17. <clears throat> he says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. <clears throat> Far from being part of creation, Jesus is before all things. Not only in the sense that He is eternal, while creation is in time, but also in the sense that His very being as the only begotten of the Father, raises Him to a unique position above and before every created being. There is no other being like Jesus. There's not another. But the exciting thing is this, that as believers, there's a day coming, soon coming, when we will receive resurrection bodies like the resurrection body of Jesus. Now, Jesus will still be different from us, okay? But we'll have the same kind of bodies, okay? We're, we're never going to rise to the position of equality with Jesus. Anybody that tells you that, they're lying, okay? Uh, run from them. <laughs> There's one God. And He has presented Himself to us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but one God. And there is no other God, and there will be no other gods, no matter what the Mormons say. <laughs> now, every created being depends for its existence on something that existed before it. 
But Jesus is before all things. Self-existent. We have no concept of that. We cannot, our mind cannot, con uh, cannot conceive of how could there be something that didn't have something before. But that's what we have with God. That's what we have with Jesus. That's what we have with the Holy Spirit. I love that verse in the Old Testament at the point prior to creation uh, when, when it said, let us make them in our image. That us was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us make them in their image. It is the power of Jesus above that holds all things together. Jesus maintains into being what has been brought into being. Jesus maintains into being what has been brought into being. He through whom all things were created now holds all things together. If Jesus withdrew himself from this earth, it would be a catastrophe. Oh, I mean, this ball that we live on would crash into some other ball somewhere and all kinds of things would be happening on this earth. I mean, it would just blow up because he created it and he maintains it and holds it all together. Now, <clears throat> verse 18. He says, He is also head of the body of the church and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Christ is the head of the body of the church. Another way it can be said that you may, uh, it may uh, be more palatable and understandable to us is Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. That's the way we use it and understand it more. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. And we know that the church is made up of all born-again believers. And we make up the body of Christ. We are called the bride of Christ in Scripture. Now, the church being the body of Christ is a common theme in Paul's writings. We've seen this, we've used this and spoken of it many times in our study concerning spiritual gifts and, and those kind of things. But just as the head controls and directs the functions of the human body, so is Jesus the head of the church to control and direct the individual believers that go together to make up the whole body of Christ on earth. Just as the physical body is made up of different members, all kinds of different parts with different functions, then we know the church, the body of Christ, is made up of different members that is determined by the different spiritual gifts or gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to each member of the body of Christ. <clears throat> and so we, we see how that we come together uh, to make up that specific whole. So, the various functions then of the members of the body of Christ will be determined by the spiritual gift or gifts that the Spirit of God has given to each of us as believers. Now, here Paul places Jesus as the beginning in relationship to the church. <clears throat> this refers to him first in time, but it also refers to him in being the source of the church's life. Paul points out that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, since Jesus was the firstborn raised from the dead, never to die again, his primacy is established over all believers who will someday experience the same resurrection that Jesus has already experienced. Now some of you as Bible scholars are going to say, wait a minute. You just said that the scripture said that Jesus is the first to be raised. That's not biblical. Because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, how can Jesus be the first one raised? Well, this is how that's true. Lazarus was raised back to life to die again. 
Jesus brought Lazarus back to life, but Lazarus died again. Yes. Isn't that terrible? Died twice. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus was resurrected to never die again. And when we become resurrected with Him, like Him, when He comes to get the church, then we will have that eternal body like His never to die again. So that's how that he can say here that even though Jesus raised Lazarus, Jesus is the first born from the dead, the first to be truly resurrected in the real biblical ultimate sense. Now Paul closes by pointing out that Jesus will come to have first place in everything. Jesus is supreme in the universe and he is to become supreme in relationship to the church. He is. We're already His as, as believers. But there's going to be that day that's coming that we're going to be His in a relationship like we've never known here. Okay? It's going to be, it's going to be the full-blown thing like it's going to be throughout all eternity. And, and I know you're as excited for that as I am. And all of the things that we talked about earlier, all of those things, every one of us is bringing us a step closer to that day when none of us knows when it is, but it's going to happen. That trumpet's going to sound. There's going to be the, that shout in heaven. And before we know it, gravity will have no power over you anymore. You will go up. And as you go up, you will receive that resurrection body. And the Christians that have been buried, they're going to come out of those graves and they're going to receive those resurrection bodies. And together, the living and the dead believers will go up to meet Jesus in the air and the scripture says, and we will forever be with Jesus. Well, and, and, and the handwriting's on the wall. I mean, you and I are getting to live in the time that this stuff is being fulfilled. We're, we're living as Christians in the time that angels have longed to see come to pass. And we're living in it. The day is soon approaching when Jesus will have first place in everything. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Now listen to me very carefully as I close. Every human being must realize that someday they will bow their knee to Jesus and confess with their tongue, with their mouth, that Jesus is Lord. But listen to this. The sad truth is that if this act of reverence has not been carried out while that person is here on this earth, then it will have no saving power when they do it in eternity. The scripture tells us now, Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13, whoever will confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord, will, whoever will believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So notice that confession of Jesus as Lord with the mouth. Doing that on this earth produces salvation. But the people that fail to do that while on this earth will be lost. They will go out into eternity, but there will be a day in which they will stand before Jesus. And in that lostness in eternity, they will be required to bow before Him and confess that He is Lord. But the confession that would have saved their soul eternally on earth, but that they didn't make on earth, will have no power to save them at that point. They will, they will bow acknowledging that Jesus is who He said He was, and they'll go out into an eternity 
separated from God in a place called hell, a place of literal fire and torment that they will never be removed from as long as anyone can ever imagine. And beyond that, it never ends. Now that's the truth of the Word of God. You say, what kind of God would send somebody to hell for eternity? The same kind of God that came and died a horrible death on the cross to save every one of those people. So what's the difference? Those who accept Christ will receive the benefit. Those who reject Christ will receive the punishment. Did Jesus not love them? No. He loved them enough to die for them. But they chose to not love Him. And because of their choice to not love and come into relationship with Him, they literally will spend eternity in the second death, which is the lake of fire. And the devil and all of those fallen demons and all those beings that are going to come out in the Revelation, the first beast from the land and the beast from the sea and uh, all these others that are going to be the... The, the dragon that's Satan and the beast that's going to be the Antichrist and the other beast that's going to be his false prophet, which is sort of like the unholy trinity, the trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the unholy trinity in the Revelation during the tribulation. You're going to have <clears throat> Satan, the dragon. You're going to have the Antichrist, uh, the first beast, and you're going to have the false prophet like the Holy Spirit for them. In, in, as the third beast, uh, the, the second beast, and, and third in that unholy trinity. But all of this is going to happen, and it's real. And, and every person needs to realize that someday they're going to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Do it today, it'll have eternal value. Fail to do it here, it will have no value at all other than simply to prove Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now, this fact causes me to ask one question as we close. Very important question. Have you bowed your knee and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Christ is Lord. If you have not, then you need to do that today. And if you recognize your sin and the need to do that today, that simply means one thing. Today is the day you can be saved. Because the Spirit of God is working with you to enable you to be saved today. And I would encourage you to make that commitment today. Our ministry team will be at the right of the room at the close of the service. They will be there to pray with you and counsel with you about that most all-important decision. Now, if you're here and you are a Christian and, um, and you have other prayer needs, they will be there to pray for you. If you have other commitments that you need to make as a Christian, they will be there to pray with you. If you are a born-again Christian and have never Follow Jesus in water baptism. I would like to talk to you at the close of the service. Okay? Because water baptism does not save you, but it is an important thing that you should do because you are saved. And I would like to get you to do that at this good weather that we're having. <laughs> uh, if you have never done that. It'll be better today than in uh, December. Okay. So, make any commitment that God is leading you to make. Let the prayer team pray for you. They are, they are anointed and, and full of the Holy Spirit and ready to do that. Our offering bucket is to the left of the doors as you exit. If you would like to participate in the ministry of this church, then I encourage you to just drop in your tithes and offerings and as always, we thank you for doing so. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Ride at 1145 at the back. Join us. We're going to have a great ride and drive. 
Uh, yes. Oh, and remember the ladies going to the retreat need to meet with the lady on the left hand side here for just a moment. And if you are not signed up for the treat, retreat and you want to, meet with them and they'll sign you up. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Come back again.